all banks will have to offer it. So they just remove that ability. So therefore, it means that um, if we want to, uh, even if, if you want to refund, so if you say to a client, um, we'll give you a commission back, you're actually doing the wrong thing by doing that. Because one, you're undercutting yourself. And two, you're trying to get unfair advantage compared to what other brokers are offering the market. So you can't actually reduce what you earn in order to benefit the client. And that's what kind of makes it a, an even playing field. Yeah. Hey, it's Julian from Loan Options AI, and today I've got a special guest and one of our partners. I'll hand over. Victor Lagos from uh, Lagos Financial. Mate, thank you so much for coming all the way uh, from Tassie. Really appreciate it. And, um, you know, we've been uh, obviously working together a lot, but I've really appreciated your approach to the way that you, um, it's, it's, you know, a lot of people are sort of going or seeing that it's valuable to go in the direction of education, but you're, you have this ability to break down like really complicated concepts into very simple, digestible videos or explanations and um, really admire that. And I'd love to kind of rewind all the way to the beginning. Like how did you start your first, like, tell us about your career, how you got into this and maybe even before that, like what led you to becoming uh, you know, a mortgage broker and going down this path and starting your own business and, and stuff like that? Yeah, there's a lot to this story actually. Um, I never actually thought i'd end up in finance it just sort of happened i used to work in in coals actually when i had a school in uh, yeah. in retail and then i but i was good in computers so i wanted to get a job in an office and i went through an agency and my first job was working for a non-bank uh, lender called bluestone mortgages oh, they're wow. called bluestone home loans yeah. now and at the time uh, this was in 2006 so it was before the gfc uh it was it's hard to explain, but basically, um, it was the company was um, outsourced. It was owned by GE Money, and before that, it was owned by uh, uh, Mark Burris, which is like Wizard Home Loans. The company was called um, uh, what they called AFG, I think. No, AFG. Um, AF. No, no. Afig. AFIG. That were oh, called. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Long, long time ago. So then, uh, GFC happened. Uh, Bluestone hired me directly. And I learned all the stuff around mortgages, post-settlement, variations, substitutions, you know, increases, partial discharges, and just started handling. And then I moved into customer retention because we went from like a, an office of like 200 staff uh, all around Australia to like one office in the city. And they stopped doing any new lending. Uh, they were about to land like a, uh, what's called a uh, securitization um, bond thing with... with um, uh, the Lehman Brothers, actually. Wow. <laughs> they were the ones that yeah, went under. I know, I know. So right before that happened. <laughs> uh, um, and, but I used... To, uh, it's funny because I met a broker. He used to be a mortgage broker. Uh, I remember his name today, to this day. I haven't connected with him. His name is Rienzi Campos. And he started work for Blue Sun. And he said to me, you know, you'd be a really good mortgage broker. You should go out and become one. And I was like, you know, maybe I will one day, but I'm still too young. Like, yeah. I'm like 20. Yeah. And I don't have experience and who am I to tell people how to do their home loans when I haven't experienced it? So he sort of planted that seed there. And uh, I wanted to get into sales, but they weren't doing any new lending. So I ended up getting a job working for a company called Fox Symes. And they do what's uh -huh. called part nine debt agreements, yeah, yeah. Right? debt negotiation. So at that point, I started helping people who were struggling with debt. You know, a lot of credit card debt, uh, car loans yeah, and yeah. things like that. And... Um, but I couldn't stick it out because um, every time there's been an opportunity where uh, like my integrity needed to be compromised, I, I couldn't stick it out. And that's kind of what happened. They wanted me to put someone in a part nine day agreement, but they knew that it was highly unlikely that it would get accepted by the banks. So that means they were going to affect their credit file for seven years at the time. It's now five years. And they were going to charge them like a five thousand dollar fee or something and i just they're like oh we just want to challenge the banks and i'm like nah i can't do that and it was high pressure but even though it was like a sales environment you have to do like 13 debt agreements a month and i actually hit that within my second month and the weird thing is they set these targets where if you don't hit 13 you you carry the shortfall the next month so if you hit 10 
then you um, need to hit 16 to make bonus the month after. Like, so it's a lot of pressure. And that's actually what got me into asset finance because I wanted to be a broker. Uh, I did my, um, my Cert 4. And same sort of thing. I wasn't quite ready to be a mortgage broker. I remember I went to an interview and it was with a, like an accountancy firm to be a mortgage broker. And they were like, the, the guy just kind of looked down at me a little bit, you know, because I was this young guy trying to come into the corporate, you know, accountancy, which is, you know, sort of the higher end of town or whatever. And at the end of it, he goes, let me give you a piece of advice. Next time wear a tie. And I just remember like, like, you know, that feeling of like, yeah. who's this guy I think he is? And, but at the same time, I was hurt, right? Because I was, you know, it's sensitive young kid, you know, trying to tap into that yeah, space. Yeah, trying to make it. Yeah. yeah. And then my next interview was with uh, with Asset Finance Company, which is called Platinum Direct Finance. Now, oh, yeah, wow, now okay. they're platform. Yeah. They were based in uh, St. Leonard's. And um, you would know these guys like Richard Q. Yeah, I know all of know? them. Yeah, you know all these guys? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, Edwin. And these guys have been um, around for, for a while. And that was the funniest interview I'd ever been to. They, um, they played this, like we had a boardroom and they played this scene. Um, fuck, what was the movie called? You know the one with like... Um, with Ben Affleck and he's kind of like, uh, I can't remember the name of the movie, but it was like literally a movie scene and it was just basically showing who was committed to this to yeah. become like, you know, to who's, who's in it. It's very salesy, but at the same time, you know, an opportunity came and I took it, but I still had a passion for mortgages. So I was, I was always asking them like, you guys going to do mortgage broking as well? And they had one guy that did mortgages, but just, he only just dealt with St. George directly. Like yeah, okay. these days you didn't need a credit license uh, or a credit rep number to do to do asset um, and they already had a tool you could do um, kind of like aggregation model like they had different funder and you can do quotes and stuff like that easy lodge yeah it was easy lodge back yeah. then the yeah. earlier, <laughs> earlier <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it was at the time it was also owned by um, I can't remember his name um, but he owned a business Mike Mike something he owned a business called Melbourne Finance oh yep yep um, he later became the CEO right is that yeah. the Mike you're talking about yeah, yeah. that's the yeah. one yeah Mike and Nichols? Mike Nichols, yeah. that's it, yeah. And um, so him and the other um, founder, I actually want, wanted to leave Asset Finance. Same, th same sort of thing. <coughs> my, my integrity was compromised because um, I had a client and this client wanted to um, do, she wanted to get a car. It was, a, it was an MX, uh, one of those small, small ones. And uh, no, it was a Mazda 2, sorry. It was a Mazda 2. It was going to cost her 20 grand, but she had come off a part nine debt agreement from Fox mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and the only way I can get her a loan was with Liberty Financial. And because it was a consumer loan, um, it all had to be disclosed, all the commission. And in order for me to make any money and make it worthwhile, um, her rate needed to be 29.9%, which is the highest they could charge. And I just felt so bad because like, she was having second thoughts when she saw the loan agreement and the loan agreement was showing her that she was going to be paying like 60 grand over the term because of the interest mm. it was going to be like... But it's know, a seven-year term at 30%. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah. And I said to her, oh, you know, like, you know, you, once, you know, you get out of the part nine, you got some repayment history, we can look at refinancing that. And, you know, and, and part of me was like, I knew that that was going to be tough. But at the same time, I was thinking about myself and the commission and that's... That's where I've, I hope to this day that it actually was a good outcome for her and yeah. she was able to get a better rate. But that was the, the sticking point for me where I was like, nah. And also some of the guys in the office were like celebrating how much commission they made in a, in a truck deal. Uh, and I think it was about 17 grand. And, and because, it, because it's commercial, they didn't talk about mm. how much is in there. And, like, and that didn't sit right with me. You know, to, to the fact that you have to charge people more without their knowledge and that becomes the game. You adjust the mm. balloon just a loan term, adjust the repayments in order for you to get paid more without them being aware of it. And so I thought, okay, I can get out of the game. And then I, um, I, I also wanted a salary because I was on a commission only arrangement. So I had an interview to become a, um, to work for a company called Camnet, which was oh, selling, printers, yeah. Yeah, selling printers, yeah, corporate printers. So one of the guys, it was a bit of a mentor to me. He's still a, quite a big asset finance broker. His name is Sean Fowler. Oh yeah, I yeah, know Sean Fowler, yeah, 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 from uh, Equipfin. Yep. He, um, I had a chat with him. We went to the office. He had a different arrangement with Platinum, so he was kind of like a franchise sort of arrangement. And I told him I was going to look at, at the printer game, 
And he goes, if you're worried about, you know, the cowboys in, in asset and in, yeah, in this space, is worse. Princess is worse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm Prin- like, what? Pr- Princess is like the, the most old school salespeople. <laughs> we recently had to replace one. And I felt like I was being transported back in time. Like all the old sales tricks, you know, like the, the like anybody who's read a sales book before knows like all these techniques, you know, they're trying to do the. Well, it doesn't matter which clothes they're trying, the alternate clothes or assumptive closing questions, yeah. like, or, or, or uh, think like, <laughs> you're just like, can you just relax? Like, just relax and just talk to me like I'm a person. Yeah. I promise you don't need to sell me anything. Yeah. I need a printer. Yeah. Like, you don't have to sell me anything. Yeah. I need one. And then like, they probably caught them off guard. Like, <laughs> how do I actually like talk to you for real? I'm used to this script going on in my mind. Right? Yeah, it's crazy. But yeah, I think um, it must have been even worse back then, but. Even now, it's just like there's a few industries that just have not changed with the yeah. times. The car industry is one of them, you yeah. know. And don't get me wrong, like there are some fantastic car dealerships that have cha- changed. I'm just talking about the average. The average yeah. dealer is not that much different, <laughs> you know. I, um, I remember listening to a sales manager talk about like cars and calling them motor cars. Like, <laughs> right? Nobody calls <laughs> a motor car. Uh, no one calls. <laughs> yeah a car a motor car anymore yeah. they haven't for 40 years yeah. mate and uh and that's just an example of you know a motor car an yeah. industry yeah. and you know they talk about things in terms of like terminal like we need to move metal like like is that really how we talk you know is that like you, yeah. you, you know what i mean that's not like how yeah. humans talk that's, that's right. like some really old dinosaur terminology in the car industry that's and industry is the same yeah, yeah it's like yeah yeah we need to move some metal like it's but just I'm, weird but. i'm super grateful that i didn't go down that path like it was these deciding moments that kept me in finance you yeah. know and because printers you know you can't even value the thing right it's it's all fugazi the mm. way they do it and and there's another thing that's called inertia payments which i also if you don't know much about it it mm. was also something that i found out that was also you know um, i don't know lack of a better word it was dodgy the way they would basically do like a dollar balloon and then in the inertia payments will go to the finance broker which is like a recurring income where they're still paying for nothing, mm. where they should literally have no debt, no outgoings and be owning all the printers, which they can trade in or start again. So again, I didn't like that. But anyways, I stayed in, I stayed in asset finance No, for a little bit. I'd actually decided that I want to go corporate. So I thought the only way I can get a good job corporate would be if I went to uni. Um, so I applied to go to uni. I also ended a relationship. That was another thing as well. Uh, they kept me at, at, at Platinum. They offered me salary. I was going to become a BDM. And then um, when the relationship ended and when I wanted to, um, uh, what do you call it, go to uni, I had to leave. Right? I, I had to build up this whole thing because I didn't even finish high school. Like I finished when I was... 16 15 yeah, 16 wow. so to get to uni i had to show like uh, equivalent of an of a an atar or a uai so i did like a like a, what's called a stat test um i did had to improve all my employment and build up an equivalent score so i got into western city uni and i was going to do a bachelor of commerce um mm-hmm. and i was going to major in like management and i started that and i was in over my head right like like to do like referencing and all these essays it was like this is just i'm just not an academic (laughs) and um and also um i realized it was a business that's the other thing this was kind of my first real taste of like being aware about business because uni is structured in a way where if you fail you have to pay for the same subject again and you, they, they add in a chapter to the textbook. So you have to buy the latest one. So you can't buy a second hand. Uh, they, um, they even said that if you fail this, that, sorry, if you, so if you fail a subject and you take it again, you have to do brand new assessments, even if it's the same thing. So you can't even redo your own work. You have to do something. Yeah. yeah it's a you scam. It's a scam, uh, man. Yeah. I, I have my thoughts on uni and it's not because I never went to uni. I never wanted to go to uni. Mm. In fact, in year 11 and 12, I opted for VET subject, VET subjects, yeah. which would disqual- two of them, which would disqualify you from an ATAR. So I actually never got an ATAR. I did finish year 11 and 12, mm. but I finished year 11 and 12 knowing exactly what I was going to do. And, um, you know, my wife's got a degree and, you know, I watched her go through everything you're just discussing. Yeah. And, you know, expe- asking and expecting students who are just trying to make it. to spe- And like the textbooks aren't $30. The textbooks are $150 yeah. each 
And, you know, a lot of them, which is, you know, in my opinion, a conflict of interest, a lot of them are written by the professors there and things like that. Oh, wow. So they're like, as part of the deal with the professors, like we'll pay you X amount, but we'll also let you sell pump books in, not sell, because they're not even really selling. They're like, you have to use this. It's like third line forcing, basically. Wow. You have to use our book. Yeah. And it's like written and you look at the name of it. It's like a professor or someone that used to be a professor there or like, it's like very incestuous, you know? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you know, I have my thoughts on uni and it's not all of them. Uh, but these days you have so many good, uh, I know some really smart people that, you know, you, you know, obviously need to go to uni for, you know, whether it was law or, you know, medicine or things like that. But, um, for most people, it's not the best option. That's the reality of it. And, you know, these days, I mean, like when I hire people, I never look at their uni degree. I never go, oh, you got a degree at this university versus another one. Like I'm looking at for things that are like more of the soft skills like yeah. you know i can teach somebody the skill set required to be a finance broker but do they have the right aptitude and attitude to want to learn are they a yeah. good person do they meet the company values i'll take that over a uni degree any day of the week yeah um so yeah i have some thoughts about it um which i've been reasonably vocal about before but i think it's um totally un totally um unnecessary in most cases and then you put somebody you know 50 60 80 100 grand in in debt um exactly the debt yeah and these days like so much good information is available online i, I kind of understand when it was necessary you know 20 years ago and you know m maybe even more actually before the internet really is when um and even like since youtube and since you know udemy and coursera and all these like there's so much good either really cheap or free information online and um you know there's a lot of there's a lot of reasons why people should actually strongly consider whether it's the best option because you know some of my, my mates that went to uni in hopes of getting a better job they were earning less money than me and had a massive debt and they ended up in similar jobs to me anyway or you know like know. it just it doesn't make sense for a lot of scenarios but and a lot yeah. of it's outdated as well like they're, yeah. they're, it's not and relevant not, to what's going not on not learning currently. real it's not the real world it's still mm. it's just like an extension of high school you know you got these sort of like nobody's in in business has ever asked me to write an essay on anything mm. you know i've never had to do that you know i write a newsletter and i can write that however the hell i want i write <laughs> it in the format that's easy to read for exactly. me that's right and i write it in a format that i think people can interpret and you know what I, I provide links where i'm referencing things but like i've never that's an optional thing that's like i want to do that nobody's ever said oh you know i need i write um lender you know when i was broking i'm not really writing loans myself now but i write lender notes but that's more like you know bullet points of like the key s summary of the facts of the client not being asked to write a three thousand word essay the lender would never read that credit yeah. analysts don't even read That's the true. three four lines of notes I know. Read, they'll call us and go oh can you explain why this and it's like oh, did you check the notes They're like oh no sorry it's too long <laughs> yeah exactly hey. yeah, yeah i know we could talk about this all day yeah. really but um i guess where where it did help me is um when i decided to um basically go out in the workforce again mm. i realized that i needed well or if i did go to uni i would have four years later assuming i passed everything mm all my finance experience would have been obsolete. Um, I would have gone back to entry level, would have been in all this debt. So I went back out looking for work, uh, got a job at Macquarie Bank and in, back into mortgages. So this was broker support and uh, credit support. And it helped me get the job because they do psychometric testing. And the psychometric tests are actually, a lot of them are trick questions. Like you have to read a lot of text and then you have to answer what the author was trying to, to convey. And because I did a, a bridging course at uni, I learned how to skim read because uh, mm. they taught me that. So I was literally skim reading a lot. I'm like, oh, yep, it's, I, could, I could find the point very quickly. And I, I was the first to finish it. And I was like, Shit, did, I, like did I rush this? <laughs> like, mm. and I walked out thinking, I hope I did well. And they called me and they said, yep, you did well on the, on the psychometric test. We want to you know, move to the next stage. So I'm like, yeah, well. So I landed the job, which is actually quite an impressive <coughs> feat, I must say, considering I didn't even go, you know, didn't finish high school. Uh, or uni and what people were getting jobs that were like graduates out of um, straight out of uni in entering to the same role that I was in right and I worked my way into credit into mortgage credit and talk about like full circle because I mentioned to you earlier when I was doing asset finance um, I did a, a I did a loan for someone that was um, 
who had done a part nine debt agreement and i and my colleague at the time did a loan for the old manager at fox home so i knew what her income level was right mm. and then when i started working at macquarie and i moved into credit I used to do uh, client, um, what do you call it, staff loans. So I would see the income of what other Macquarie staff were earning. And one of those that I approved was my old asset finance BDM. <laughs> so I saw what he was earning. And I think that also opened up my eyes because some of the like divisional directors and um, um, they call them DDs and um, uh, EDs, executive directors, I have this stat- uh, corporate status structure. Some of them were earning like a million bucks a year. Wow. And you don't even know who these people are. Like, they're not running divisions. They're literally just like, you know, so I started thinking about it. I'm like, it's because they give you money. It's called a profit share because they're sharing profit with people who bring money into the bank. Mm. Right. So, but it, but I was in ops. So I'm, a, I'm part of the cost center. Yeah. You yeah. see, that's why my income levels were, were capped because, the, you know, yes, yes, while it's required, I'm not earning the money, I'm costing the money. Mm. So, that also made me think about business differently. I wanted to be a BDM, but then at the same time, I knew, like, I always had this attitude. I became a subject matter expert in every job I ever had. I was the guy that was teaching new people, you know, mentoring them, bringing them up to scratch because I became that, that SME internally. So I knew all the, all the flaws and I was always trying to find ways to process, improve things. But, you know, when it's, when it's a, a large organization like Macquarie you need there's a lot of red tape you need to get you know uh, you, they have allocation of funds for different projects and when you want to change even one thing within the software it needs to be go to IT and I remember I even made IT contacts to say can you price this up and tell us how many hours it'll take to do this mm-hmm. and I would try to build a case to try to make things uh, faster and more efficient but you know it always kind of got put to the side because it's not the priority, right? They're, yeah. they're doing new core banking systems and all this other stuff that's costing them a lot of money and resources. So I got a friend of mine that had left Macquarie. She started working for a property investment group and she got me a job interview to be a mortgage broker for them. And so I took I took the role and I became a mortgage broker. This was 10 years ago, so 2014, just under 10 years. Um, and that opened up my eyes because now all of a sudden I see all these people making money on property and I have all these lending skills because now I understand credit, I understand what banks look for. So I was like hitting the numbers. I was like super excited. I was doing really, really well. But because I had that experience with people with bad debt, I wanted to bridge the gap because right? there's people that have got you know issues with managing money. I had also had a bit of experience. I was in a lot of credit card debt at a young age, like from 18 and 20. <laughs> My mom was in a lot of debt and I've shared this on, on other podcasts as well that, you know, it's a lot to do with, um, you know, your upbringing and, and, and your attitude around money and your belief systems around it and, and, and the patterns and, and habits that you create around it. So I'm learning about money and about wealth and I've also got these old stories that I'm carrying and old habits. So I, I wanted to help people, which is essentially a reflection of what I was going through, right? <laughs> I wanted to help myself, but I wanted to help others with that same issue. So that's been a 10-year journey to get to the point where I'm at now, which is obviously owning Lagos Financial, um, and I do residential and commercial um, investors, and I'm also uh, setting up a new business called uh, Propeller, which is uh, basically strategic advisory for property investors. And you mentioned earlier about education. Yeah, That's a, that's a key part that's missing in, mm. this, in this space, is like real-life education. And I think like you've you've created that because you know you obviously didn't really find what you were looking for in that process of trying to you know educate yourself. You know you tried the uni, you tried all these things, and you probably didn't get what you were looking for. And that is, you know, um, you know, sort of the the direct specific examples. You know, there's a lot of high level stuff and yeah. people talking about all kinds of things, but really um, sometimes you just need somebody to say if you need to execute this, like here are the three things you need to do to get yourself in order for that. Mm. Um, and yeah, but it's, it's a, it's a great story and, you know, thank you for being obviously so, so open about it. You know, there's obviously a lot of sensitive topics in there, but Mm. you know, I think sometimes you you end up delivering on the things that you probably felt there was either a gap in the market for or, and so it it kind of is, um, it's a, it's a, it's a great story. And, and obviously you've got your own podcast and, you know, you've, you've, you've shared a lot of this sort of this personal journey before, but it's good to kind of hear it and, and watch how it un- unfolds. It, 
I agree totally. You know, the asset finance industry still has plenty of cowboys in there. It's better than it was probably back then, but, um, you know, different commissions being capped and all this kind of stuff, you know, there's less ability to have those, you know, moments where you got teams like, you know, yelling, cheering, screaming yeah. over like how much money they made off a client, but it still does happen in the industry. Yeah. You know, I would love to see the asset finance space move more into the mortgage broker style where, you know, the rate is the rate and, you know, here's how much commission is built in. Um, that would work really well for our model. Our, per, our my, it's my personal view. We would thrive in that environment because when you take away, like right now you could go to five different brokers and get five different rates. And the reason for that is the lenders give you, in asset finance, the lenders usually give you a base rate and then you have a markup or a margin. Yep. And it's like, it's a lot less than what it used to be. Like before you could basically give the client double the interest rate, which is just crazy how yep. that was ever allowed. But, you know, now it's more like up to 2% or so, you know, so if the base rate is eight, maximum you might be able to get is 10. And, you know, every business has a margin, like a, a construction company has like, you know, their costs and then labor and then a margin. Right. Um, and so, but, but it feels wrong that in order to make money, you've got to like specifically put that client in a worse position, you know, that, that's just, know. there's something really wrong about that. And so, um, we've made our business off the back of like the level of transparency that we give clients, you know, yes, here's the fees, here's how much we make, here's how much, you know, whether it's a referral partner payment or whatever, like here's everything. And. Um, some customers, yes, it costs us business when you're being that transparent and your competitors aren't, you know, for sure there's some clients that look at it and go, you know, that I'm uncomfortable with that, you know, the reality is the competitors are doing it, but they're just not telling them or they're making it buried really deep in the back of some document that they're never going to read. Um, and so, yes, we lose some business cause we're too, almost too transparent. Um, and we we're having this conversation internally about it yesterday cause, um, we did all the work. We presented all the options to the client and um, when they Googled one of the lenders, that lender was offering um, direct uh, a slightly lower rate, which, you know, is channel conflict. But, um, you know, there's nothing stopping the customer from, even though we've done all the work, going there. And so there's a lot of times where we do all the work and then get not, not paid. Like our, our model is, and same with mortgage brokers, is success only. Mm -hmm. You know, like we... we uh, I know some brokers charge a mandate fee or whatever, but like generally speaking, unless you get the client a great outcome and you help them settle the loan, you get paid nothing. So it'd be like the equivalent of a, a carpenter putting the whole framing up um, and maybe there's a few you know, timbers left remaining and then the client says, actually, you know what? I don't want to use timber. I want to use steel to frame my house. Um, so thanks, but you know we're all good here. And, you know, and then you, the carpenter doesn't get paid, you know, it's like, it, it's, it's one way of looking at it. You know, it is weird that, that that's the case, but, um, it does drive competition and it makes it solely about delivering good customer outcomes. Cause if you don't deliver good customer outcomes, you get paid nothing. So, yeah, I do admire what you've built and the transparency. I think this is also <clears throat> why I jumped on board very early on with yeah. loan options, because I saw that you guys were being transparent and I, also know that you guys like genuinely care about the client and yeah. getting the outcome and if it means that you know they get a better deal elsewhere and that's their that particular client's prerogative prerogative like they don't actually value the relationship yeah. long term and they just want a better rate because ultimately people are going to make decisions yeah. for their own back pocket predominantly especially in car finance right asset finance so and you sometimes have to let them go yeah. and and i think that's it is hard and it's the same for, for mortgage brokers. But when you have such a good culture and, and, and good um, values and principles that you operate with, then you end up actually sometimes better off not dealing with clients yeah. that think that way. Yeah, you I, know? I, I was saying that the other day. There's some customers and referral partners that yep. we tell to go away. Yep. And the reason for that is the amount of energy they sap from you. Correct. And... Um, you know, they're more than likely never going to be happy. You could get them a rate of 0% and no fees and do everything for them and they'll still find something. And, you know, when you get yourself into a position 
like one of the reasons I started my own business was so that I could choose who I want to deal with, you know, and there's partners that we've turned away and it's like, you know, we'll continue to do that because if you send us dodgy deals or you're really aggressive with how you talk to my staff, n zero chance you, I'm going to con continue to deal with you. Zero. Exactly. Um, we've had, you know, different low integrity partners that, you know, will, um, because our portal is so transparent and it tells them which lender and all that kind of stuff, they basically use us and our platform as a research tool and they have no intention of actually giving us the deal. Oh, you know, wow. so, so there's different things and there's always going to be people that manipulate it. But, you know, when we see those people like, oh, you're running heaps of scenarios and you're calling us heaps, but we never get any deals from you. We say, oh, thanks, but no thanks. You know, we don't, we're not interested in, in dealing with low integrity partners. You know, we want to align ourselves with partners that generally see the value that we bring and if you don't see the value that we bring one of two it's one of two things either we're not a good fit for you and in that case like like go somewhere else you know like we can we can tweak our business model to cater for different businesses in some areas but we're not going to make wholesale changes that's going to upset 99 percent of our uh, referrer partner base to service the one percent you know the squeaky wheel you know the yeah. squeaky wheel doesn't get the you know the oil in our in our in our operation it's like we treat everyone with respect. We give everybody great service levels. And if they, you know, if it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. You know, yeah. we, I can't, you can't put a square peg in a round hole. And I've told partners that. I'm like, look, the way that you want to run things and, um, you know, it's not really in line with our business model. And, you know, it's probably not our on our roadmap to run it the way that you want us to run it. And so if it's not a good fit, we'll walk away. Like, no hard feelings, you know. It's, we can't, our business model can't suit everybody. Yeah. It just can't like it's just it's the reason why there's more than 80 banks and lenders and if you talk to some brokers they'll say this is their favorite lender and you talk to other brokers they'll say that's their favorite lender yeah correct it's but more it's more about the qu uh, quality than it is the quantity right? for sure and we we've prided ourselves on keeping that totally unbiased thing and we have said to clients hey look that offer you've gotten from the dealer because they've got a special rate or you know a special promo on like, that's a that's the best offer you're going to get like and they're always surprised by that but guess what happens they call us next time because we're honest with them. We're like, hey, our job is to get you the best deal. That's our job. You know, that's what you're engaging us to do. And so if we're going to try and convince you that the offer we're going to put in front of you is better and try and deceive you in any... No, we'll just tell you the truth. And you know what? Sometimes it actually works out that like the, the offer they got from the dealer was like too good to be true and like they weren't approved yet and that rate is only subject to X, Y, Z conditions. Yeah. But because we've already let them go and said, no, no, go with that. If that's a real offer, like go with that, that's a really good offer. They'll come back and go, ah, probably was too good to be true. And the trust level is so much higher once you've yeah. let them go because they come back or they come back with like, oh, can you help my daughter or my sister or yeah. my, you know? And, um, and trust is one of the most important things you can have in any professional service really. But finance broking is especially so because you know the thing is what else do you have to offer you know um yes we've got you know great tech and all this kind of stuff but the tech is only great because people trust it so like whichever way you break it down why people use you know a professional whether it's a broker or an accountant or a lawyer or whatever if the trust isn't there you've got nothing so you must have trust that's why like Social proof is really important, you know, like five star reviews, really important. What people are saying about you, testimonials, it helps in building trust because people can see, like, oh, why did that person use them? Like, what did they see the value in? Oh, they were really good at communicating. They got me a great deal. They were really fast and responsive. Like, those testimonials and things like that, they're really, really helpful for small businesses because it helps paint a picture of like what they can expect from you. Mm. Um, but we've prided ourselves on being totally unbiased and that's one of the reasons we have trust. You know, it's not just the reviews and all this kind of stuff. It's like we publish our numbers online. We say, here's how much deals we're doing. Here's how much money we're paying to referral partners. Here's how much we're doing, you know, X, Y, Z. And even the lenders we use, you know, like the most recent report I uh, published, which was based on last financial year, the one that's just passed was like, you know, we have more than 90 lenders now. And in one financial year, we used 88 of them. And that's unheard of. You know, most brokers have 30 lenders, 40 lenders if they've got a really big panel. Um, some might have 40, 50 at the very most. You know, we've got more than 90 and it's not just like a number. We're using 88 of them in one financial year. And why that's an important metric is it shows that we're not just pushing clients to lenders that benefit us the most because 
there is a reality that some lenders pay us more commission than others. Yeah. There's that's the reality, you know, and that's why I thought like in the mortgage broking space, it's a little bit better because there might be some variation between lenders, but it's almost identical lender to lender. It's it's so close. Whereas in asset finance, there's a really big discrepancy between the lender that pays the lowest commission and the lender that pays the most commission. It's mm -hmm. very large, uh, the, the, the variation. Um, and you know, we had no lenders receive more than 15% of our business. Um, two lenders received more than 10%. So if you think about just use picking a number, like we're talking about percentages, so let's use a hundred, right? Two lenders received more than out of a hundred deals, two lenders received more than 10 deals. And then the remaining rest of it, like the vast majority of the um, deals were, uh, sorry, of the lenders were less than 5%. Mm. So there's so many lenders getting just fractions of our volume that that goes to, that's what I was saying, like why it's important is it goes towards proving that we are what we are saying we are. We are totally unbiased. We don't choose a lender based on who pays us the most commission. We choose a lender based on whatever the client's requirements are. That might be, and we ask them in our process to prioritize what's important to you because like anything, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Sure. So, you know, you might want to prioritize the best rate, but then that might give you trade-offs in like early termination fees. So if you're planning on keeping the loan for six months before paying it out, rate's probably not the most important factor. So we let them choose in order of priority. There are some rare cases where you can have your cake and eat it. It's very, very rare. <laughs> But you know, sometimes the lender that's got the best rate because of your specific profile, that specific lender is actually the cheapest and then also has all these other great benefits as well. But that's why we ask them to rank it because if we don't get that rare opportunity where you can have your cake and eat it too, what's more important to you? Is a lower repayment more important to you or is flexibility to pay out early or is like easy documentation process? You know, like especially for self-employed clients, some of them, their financials aren't in order, you know, and, or maybe they're not up to date, but like they still have the ability to buy this equipment and it's going to help them generate X amount of revenue in their business. So if we just make it easy for them and, you know, we do it as a low doc, then um, we're getting them a great outcome. And so maybe they're prepared to like pay a little bit more on the rate versus going to sort of a major bank that's going to put them through this two week process. You know, we can get them approved in one day with just their IDs and you know a consent form signed, versus going through financials, bank statements, bad statements. You know, let's check if your ATO portals are up to date. That might work for some people who really care. They're not in a rush. They really care about the lowest rate, the lowest rate, and we'll chase that if that's what the client wants. But equally, we've got alternative solutions for people that don't care about 0.2 of a percent. They just need the equipment by Friday because they've got a job starting and. <laughs> You know, if they miss the job, they're going to they're lose this opportunity or they're going to pay, they're gonna have to hire equipment that's going to cost them thousands of dollars. So the extra 0.2 of a percent is like nothing to them. It's actually going to cost them more money if they wait. So mm. it's like every client is different, but we can guarantee that once you tell us what, what's important to you, we're going to execute on that. You know, we're going to find you the best deal that is suitable for your profile. We're going to find you a lender that gives you exactly what you need. You know, if you're going to pay out early, Let's not worry about like, especially in commercial because the termination fees across mm. most lenders are just ridiculous. If you're going to keep it, if you're someone who likes to upgrade their car every 12 months, don't go with the lowest rate because you're only going to pay the interest for that one year. Mm. Go with a lender with the most flexibility and you know, one of our lenders, for example, on commercial, no early termination fees. The amount that you're going to pay in termination fees is, and, um, is far going to outweigh the cost um, you know, of, of paying a little bit more on the rate but getting no early termination fees. It's like... We're there to help educate the client. We're there to help listen, listen to their needs and then present solutions. And sometimes what we'll do is we'll give them a scenario and we'll say, look, um, here's the cheapest rate option because that's, you know, a lot of people just think that's the best way to shop on finance and we'll present that to them and then we'll show them like, but when you want to get out of it in 12 months, here's the estimated cost that it's going to charge you or slightly more expensive on the rate over here look at the payout figure, mm. how much money you're going to save. And they go, oh, wow, I didn't know that. And it's like, that's what we're here for. That's why you, you're paying us to do this for you. Um, but it's just so important that people see that because, you know, I know a lot of brokers who claim to be unbiased, um, but I know 
for a fact that you know they prioritize two or three lenders because that's where they get the most commission it's like is this in the asset finance space you mean yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so mortgage broking is obviously different because it all comes more down to policy yeah. um and you know trying to navigate who's going to approve that loan for the client um mm. and it's very centered on serviceability too yeah, right? yeah. that's what i was going to say and usually it's around who's going to lend the most amount yeah. of money <laughs> especially when it comes to the interest rates and how high they are so you know, yes, as much as everyone wants the lowest rate and the lowest fees, um, yeah, it's going to come down to, you know, if someone gives you a low rate, but, you know, you go to a non-bank and, you know, you got to pay, you know, 1% above, but it gets you an extra 200 grand and that 200 grand gets you a property that's going to generate you a lot more capital more, growth. More capital growth. Yeah, or have way better rental yield. Right. Or, yeah, it's like... What's 2% of an interest rate? Or 1%. So that's, that's a different part to navigate, but that's for investors, for example. But, uh, you know, you talked about the interest rate, um, you know, the ability to, you know, adjust the rate to get paid more, which is something that's more in asset. And why I guess I like residential mortgages is because, you know, w what happened with best interest, Judy, is it meant that we don't have the ability to dial down our commissions in order to give the client a better rate. So we can't, we used to. So, you know, Macquarie, for example, would let us reduce our trail and we would get a better rate. Since bid, we can't do that because otherwise we're unfavorably giving some clients that while others mm. can't have it. Mm. So they need, otherwise all banks will have to offer it. So they just remove that ability. So therefore it means that um, if we want to, uh, even if, if you want a refund, so if you say to a client, um, we'll give you a commission back, you're actually doing the wrong thing by doing that because one, you're undercutting yourself and two, you're trying to get an unfair advantage compared to what other brokers are offering the market. So you can't actually reduce what you earn in order to benefit the client. And that's what kind of makes it a, an even playing field. Yeah. Right? But see, I love the even playing yeah. field because yeah. guess what happens? When you actually present an even playing field, and this is why I would love for asset finance to be in the same type of model. Um, yes, it'll be an adjustment period. Yes, there'll be a whole bunch of brokers that won't like it. But the reality is the ones that won't like that are the ones that don't really have anything to offer mm -hmm. uh, in terms of a true value proposition. They're just there to, they're good at sales. They're good at, get, they're there to gouge people and make as much money off the least amount of deals possible. We're the opposite. We're trying to help as many customers as possible and just make a smaller margin. Mm. You know, um, if they were to change that, what would actually happen is then you would actually genuinely have to have a good value proposition. Because sure. if your rate is the same as the next broker's, it then becomes how do you, how well can you acquire customers? And then how well can you keep them? And if your service is, if your sales is really good, you'll acquire customers. But if your service is bad, you won't keep them. Sure. And so you really, truly have to be putting the customer first, giving them fantastic service, having a good value proposition, making the process easy for them. And so it actually makes the whole industry rise when you do that. So a level playing field in most cases is actually going to make everyone rise because then you're competing on value proposition, not on price. And so, you know, we have some, um, some lenders give us preferential rates because of our size and scale. And I would sacrifice that if the rest of the playing field was leveled in other areas as well. So like a broker who's just starting out as an example, I'm not going to say which lenders because then everybody's going to go to those lenders and, and say, give me the same. Mm -hmm. But um, some lenders give us better rates than the next broker. And so customers can get the benefit of that if they deal with us. But equally, I would sacrifice that part to make it even everywhere else. Because if yeah. you went to five, if you call up five different asset brokers now and ask them what their best rate is, uh, give them a scenario and stuff, I bet you, you get five different repayments, five different rates, five different, and they're probably all using the same lender, but you're getting five different rates. It's just a, it's a model that I think can be improved. Um, and I think it will over time, you know, yeah. as things go towards more technology, um, I think the brokers, the really good brokers are going to stay around because they'll be able to prove their value, you know, really complex scenarios, edge cases, high ticket deals. Um, but the, the mum and dad, PAYG, been in their job three years, buying a Toyota Camry, like a, a machine, an AI, uh, you know, a piece of technology, a decisioning system can do that way faster and way more efficiently than a human can. That's right. just the that's the brutal fact. Fa fact that like, that's the truth, um, and you know, so brokers are not going to be 
uh, extinct per se, they're going to be moved higher and higher up the value chain. The service that they provide is going to be more and more important for edge cases because computers can't do the remaining, let's call it the 80-20 rule, right? 80% of deals they might be able to, to do and automate. The remaining 20%, that's where really good brokers are going to be worth more. They're going to be worth their weight in gold because it's like now computers can do the easy stuff. And really your job is to prove how good you are doing the remaining 20%, all the edge cases, all the stuff that is way too complicated uh, or outside the box for a computer to just go yes or no. Yeah. Um, and so I, I just see it as like over time, we're going to see more and more go towards this, um, you know, uh, fast pace, um, auto decisioning, like all of that. It's, it's heading that way and the better AI gets and the better technology gets and unfortunately our industry is not notoriously um, well I mean it's it's kind of it, it is notorious for being slow with technology I mean like even this CDR thing like we've got banks pushing back on it and then uh, fintechs are like pushing it and you know it's just like CDR is meant to be the next best thing years ago and it's still like lagging and why do you think that is the banks are pushing back on it yeah yeah, yeah the big good. banks don't want it because it's going to make it too easy for customers to switch and um a lot of great fintechs are building excellent products to help customers avoid the loyalty tax but it's like same thing with the insurance industry mm. you know like when's the last time anybody got an insurance renewal and their premium was lower never mm. i don't know one person ever that's ever had that happen and then that's their model the insurance model is we've got to protect what we have that's why like very few or no insurers offer apis and things like that they don't want that they want the the old school dinosaur model where they can just make it difficult so that they don't want the automation they want like they want it to be difficult because then you, it's such a hassle to call up wait, wait on, hold on hold for 30 minutes to get another quote you know all the online stuff um you know, has helped make it easier to quote, but the comparison sites are owned by insurance companies. And this is some things that people don't know. Yeah. It's like, you know, go and check who the owners of Compare the Market are, you know, <laughs> and go and see which products they offer and, and then notice which products aren't on there. You know, it's like, mm. you're not getting a true comparison. You're getting the products that they want you to compare. And it's like price anchoring and they'll always lead you down you know, it doesn't matter. I'll say it was like budget insurance, like yeah. budget insurance. They're going to lead you down that path. They're going to show you a few other products that are more expensive up here to make budget seem so much cheaper. And then you're like, well, it's so much cheaper that I don't need to go elsewhere and go to each insurance website one by one, you know? And, and so that's very deliberate because how many people actually f find a list of every car insurer or just or home insurer and then go to every website one by one? They don't, they go yeah. compare the market and they're, yeah. they're getting a false comparison is my opinion. I don't care if they hate me for that, but you know, that's, yeah. that's what it is. It's just the truth. Um, and so how many places can you go to get a truly unbiased comparison on things? Now, the brokers are one of the last few true services. And that's why we need all of the people that are running it with a bias towards certain lenders. We need them out of the industry really, because Agreed. as soon as um, one thing goes bad, they're going to tarnish the rest of us with, yeah. with this sort of the, this approach of like, making one or two lenders a preference and then and you know i'm not talking about you know having two of them receive you know more than 10 percent. i'm talking about some brokers have 80 percent of their volume going to three lenders mm -hmm. that's not true broking no. that's convenience broking agreed um and that's it's convenience for the broker for two reasons one is they're probably really familiar with those systems and really familiar with those credit teams mm -hmm. and things like that then it's also convenient that those lenders also happen to pay a lot of commissions. So yeah, I was going to ask about yeah. that. Does volume bonus still exist? Yeah, it does. Yeah. So that could be another reason, right? So yeah, can you explain a little bit about how that works? Yeah, so volume bonuses um, is like if you hit certain tiers. And look, here's the thing: if you were to approach lenders directly, it would be very hard for a, a smaller broker to hit any kind of level of volume bonuses. So what actually happens is people use aggregators and the aggregators almost always hit those tiers of volumes with the lenders. And so when they hit those tiers, they pass on a certain percentage to 
asset finance brokers of that volume bonus. And that doesn't matter. I'm, you know, I'm not going to get into the exact percentage, but it might be anywhere from 50 to 90% of the, the volume bonus that the asset broker gets passed through. And with some lenders, the, the volume bonus could be two and a half percent. With some lenders, it could be half a percent. So like what, you know, on a hundred thousand dollar loan, the VBI could be two and a half grand by itself with a certain lender, mm. you know, and on other lenders, it could be 500 bucks, you know? Yeah. So like, which one are you going to use? Especially if like you've had to discount the rate or the fee or whatever, like you're going to see people prioritize that. And our business would be way more profitable if we did that and just followed most VBI, mm. but it comes at a cost to the customer. And typically speaking, the lenders that have the higher VBIs, because they all have very similar cost of funds, right? Like yeah. some of them more in the subprime space, so their, their rates are higher, their yields are higher. Um, and because they would have more losses, they have to have higher base rates and stuff. But they all have, you know, relatively similar cost of funds. They're getting them usually from the same capital markets and things like that. Um, so what's the difference? How much commission they pay? And usually the ones that pay the highest commission and the highest VBI have the highest, rate. have the highest rates. Yeah. Um, and so some of them use it as an acquisition strategy. They go low rates, high commission, get growth, 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 growth. And then slowly over time, they just move the needle. Rates go up instead of like when they're meant to move them up by 25 basis points, they move them up by 75 basis points. Mm. And so brokers don't necessarily notice the creep, but it, it they're just different strategies. You know, they're, they're all businesses at the end of the day entitled to make money. But um, you're never going to hear me say that we, sh we shouldn't let people make money. But um, my point there is, you know, when you've got that such a large discrepancy, um, you know, in, in mortgage space, you've got no volume bonus and then you've got pretty similar. The last time I checked, I'm not 100% sure and, and I'll need you to correct me here, but like it's like 0.55% up front and then 0.15 or something for trail or something like that. And most of them are there or thereabouts. Co yeah. Correct me. So it, it's a range as well. So it's usually, yeah. If it's re if it's residential, yeah. um, it's usually 0. 0.6 up okay. to 0. 0.7 yeah. uh, plus GST. That's on the on the upfront, and then the, the trail is usually a uh, 0.15 of yeah. the loan amount. But then commercial is totally different. Yeah, yeah, right? and that's again unregulated space. Yeah. Like you know, it's a lot more sharks in that <laughs> space. So you could you got to certainly use a broker to help you navigate those uh, yeah. shark infested waters. But um, yeah, the the that that part like even the variation between 0.55 and 0.7 like if that's the range it's not a big range it's it's much smaller than the range that you would get from the best um commission the highest commission payer to the lowest commission payer in asset finance where it could be the difference between three percent commission and ten percent mm -hmm. commission um and yeah and generally speaking the ones that pay 10 have higher rates it's just like the reality do you think trail commission could actually benefit asset finance 100 percent. Mm. yeah i've been begging a few lenders to bring in trail i would sacrifice up front for trail because yeah. the thing is we have such a big seasonality in our space sure. um asset finance like you got may june which are typically except for this june it was a, a bit of a wreck um the market doesn't really know what it wants to do at the moment it's everyone's in limbo but um may and june november march they're typically like the four best months of the year um, and then we have some months of the year that are just terrible, right? Like mm. July is typically terrible, albeit this July has been very good for us. Um, December, January and April, which is usually around Easter, school holidays, all that kind of stuff. Like those are the months of the year that are, that are bad. And so we have this really big seasonality, peaks and troughs. Trail Commission would help smooth that out, but it would also help focusing on longevity with your client, like properly servicing their needs. In our industry, it's so common for brokers to just settle the deal, say congratulations for your settlement, and then never talking to the client again. It's very transactional mm. asset finance, more so than home loans. And clawback period is shorter, but there is clawbacks. Um, but it's like some lenders are coming more, more and more, it's becoming more and more common that lenders are playing direct as well. And so the, when you've got this, this angle that the lender's now competing with you, the lender that wants you to give them lots of business is now competing with you. That's why I really, really love and respect the lenders that are broker channel only. Mm. You know, I really love that. Um, for me, that's 
um, that's the way uh, it should be. Or the you can have a customer a direct customer channel. I don't have a problem with that, but don't offer the cu direct customer channel lower rate. Uh, lower rate because mm. it's like, how does that make sense? The broker is doing so much of the work for you, and um, you know, but. I realize why they do. I know why they do it is because they they look at it from a lifetime value perspective. Like the broker might use them this time, but the next time the client comes back, might go to a different lender. You know, so I get it, but it's um, it's not doing the right thing by the customer because you know if you um, you're trying to acquire that customer, you should try and acquire them by offering a great product. You know, overall, not just like rate, but you know whether it's fees or service levels or all that kind of stuff. Um, deliberately disadvantage broker, disadvantaging brokers and there's not a lot of lenders that do that most of the times um, lenders that play in the direct channel do it the right way where it's like either the same or if anything it costs more via the direct channel because it's like the broker is literally doing so much of the work and preparing it and understanding it and running all the checks first and the conversion rate is much higher you know you might mm -hmm. have with some of our lenders we have like 80 plus percent submission to approval rate in the direct channel, the conversion rate's probably 3%, 5% mm. in that range. So it's so much more expensive. Yes, you don't have to pay the commission to the broker, but- You're paying salaries. You're paying right? salaries Super, to service that, yeah. Right. And you're not mm. really you're paying a credit analyst who's gonna assess deals from multiple brokers. Correct. So it's kind of spread, but um, yeah, it's, it's just such an interesting space. It's such a dynamic space and there's always so much regulatory scrutiny on it. And I think for the most part, um, a little bit of regulation is good. It's, it's got to be careful not to over-regulate the space to the point where it makes it impossible for the smaller broker to survive because, you know, um, broking very much is a relationship game and, you know, ideally you don't want too much concentration in the big players because then that's where, you know, they can start to dictate market terms and, you know, it's just um, mortgage broking has always been a good career for people who, you know, genuinely want to help customers and um, love the idea of like educating people and creating wealth for people and all that kind of stuff. It's probably a good segue actually. Um, you know, I've noticed like with some of the, the, the content that you create, um, it's very sort of, parts of it are very investor um, focused and, you know, what is it that you've seen that kind of makes you want to focus on that? Is it, is it the... Um, is it the fact that like this is such in Australia, especially such a great way for people to build wealth? It's quite a, um, you know, it's very blue chip if you're sort of talking about as far as investments being safe is concerned. Um, what kind of um, push it in that direction? Yeah, it's a good question. It's because uh, multiple reasons. That's probably one of the core reasons is that the system itself is actually quite uh, uh, siloed. So if you consider the ecosystem of um, financial services, you've got uh, mortgage broking, you've got um, uh, accounting, financial planning, uh, and now you've got the rise of sort of buyer's agents that have come up in the last few years for established properties. And then you've also got the um, old industry, which is still unfortunately taking advantage of a lot of people out there. And that's, that's uh, um, the property marketeers. So these are the, they, they present to be experts, but ultimately they're selling off the plan and house and land packages. And my parents, again, back to the personal story, my parents uh, were sold into one of these developments in Queensland uh, before I was really um, aware of what was going on, before my experience working for a property investment marketeer, basically. Um, and because of that, there was no strategy they didn't consider their their uh, their risks, their timelines, their ability to borrow, um, uh, their, their true objectives. Their, um, you know how to set up the right insurances, the right cash buffers to to reduce their risks. It was strategy based on that organization selling them property because they get paid on commissions. So and so it's definitely not uh, <coughs> unbiased. It's very biased, and and they're baby boomers. So if they didn't do that and they were better with managing their money and they were more uh, educated and financially literate and they had a better team around them, they would be in that percentile of baby boomers that are the wealthiest generation, right? That held on to property over the last, you know, 30, 40 years, maybe less than that sometimes, 
who are sitting on well, multi-millionaires, right? And the first generation to have superannuation as well. They would be that. But unfortunately, because of that, along with um, my mum not being good with, uh, you know, with cre- credit cards and things like that, she's now, they are both nearly 80 and they're on the pension and they're still renting and have no money to their name. So when you, like, I can say that now without yeah. getting too emotional about it because, you know, I've said it so many times, but when, when I realized that that happened, like I've been looking for a solution for that. And property investment, if done correctly, is the ticket. It's the way that someone can actually achieve their financial goals, mm. um, pull back from work, start focusing on things that really matter to them, whether it's um, you know, setting up a business with limited risk because they have you know, assets growing and, and multiple income streams, or whether it's um, giving back to their community or, or investing in other worthy causes, or just living from a place of, of, of more passion, purpose, and, um, and, and of service. So it's like if property will allow that. And because it's an asset that is uh, necessary, if you consider um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's, you need shelter. Yeah, right? absolutely. You need, you need to provide that for your family and for others. And more and more people can't afford to, to buy, so they're renting. And who owns the rentals? Investors. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's providing housing for people that, um, that need to live. So, so if you do it right and use data, uh, data and, and the right metrics you can invest in areas not just because you're going to get growth and a certain rental yield but because it meets your particular strategy it meets your risk tolerance it meets your um your financial uh, borrowing capacity constraints you know there's the right structures and all that sort of put in so that's that's fundamentally why i've um focused on this because i'm trying to resol- uh, solve that for for many many Australians, and use education as a means to to be able to you know improve their financial literacy, uh, because it all you can't just take shortcuts. And I've been there before. People want to go in the next hot spot, they want to invest where their neighbour is telling them how much properties they've got, or where they you know some of their friends have bought in you know in you know Perth or, or Mackay or wherever it is to Woomba, and they think okay I need to put all my money there, and they literally skip strategy, structure, planning. Um, you know, uh, insurances, um, buffers, they skip all of that and go straight to buying and commit to, you know, a mortgage mm-hmm. for the next 30 years. And if, if, a, if it was a buyer's agent or if it was a, a property spruker that's selling off the plan, usually it's skewed that they benefit more than the investor, at least in the beginning. Um, and unfortunately, many people have to sell because circumstances change. Yeah or it becomes un- unaffordable and they sell before they were able to realize those gains and then somebody else gets those gains. Yeah. So um, I guess when, if you think about um, broking, you, you talked earlier about technology and AI and you know, we're, in, we're in a time where there's a lot of this change happening and, and banks are also aware that they're putting all the eggs in one basket. They're letting brokers you know, write 70 to 75 percent of all residential mortgages right by brokers where that's been growing so you know cba for example has now unloan created you know about this yeah, yeah. yeah. well be even after unloan they yeah, started the, with unloan yeah i know and then they've got that refinance quick refi or whatever the quick refi product is cba yeah that's right it's cba brand uh it's just it's another distribution channel for yeah. them but that's the start of it it's showing that they can offer a lower rate direct to consumer uh, without a broker intermediary where they don't have to pay commissions because that's a cost mm. and they can offer a lower rate. But that's only select customers, right? The ones that are mum mm. and dad, PAYG, strong serviceability, nice and simple. You know, the tech will do the credit decisioning. So there's no real need to pay a broker to literally get those documents and submit them through an online portal yeah. uh, and pay them upfront and trail for the next 30 years. It's just logically it doesn't make sense to pay brokers for that. It's a service game. You have to actually deliver value to your clients. Yeah, yeah. And and I strongly believe that if you're a broker that and all you do is that, your days are numbered. Yeah. <laughs> right? I think it's going towards this av- advice and strategy. Correct. Uh, and I couldn't agree more. I'll tell you like I'll tell you a story. Um my first mortgage, if I knew what I if I know if I knew what I know now, I'd be a much wealthier person. Um, my first mortgage, um, I saved all the deposit. Like, you know, look, I'm, you know, you, you speak about your parents' financial situation. You know, I was from a single mum, raised five kids, you know. Wow. And so I watched her, um, you know, her parents both pass away in the space of three months. And at the same time, 
she was separating from my dad um, and I think I was in year five or year six at the time and I watched her um, go through that you know the divorce was finalized and then her parents passed away and then they were going to put the family home that she grew up in for sale on the market because you know death like as soon as there's money involved like it does weird things to people and you know um, instead of you know, because she's from, she was one of nine siblings. Wow. So like between the nine of them, they could have probably tried to protect the family home and kept it and maybe invested in it together or, you know what I mean? Like it's the family home. Nine of them grew up after moving from war-torn Lebanon, you know? So um, my mom actually, with the help of her, one of her brothers, um, you know, uh, p- purchased the, the, the property from the estate. And so that was where we grew up. But I just watched her like, you know, try and juggle taking us to school and working and, you know, she's like part-time or whatever. And um, it was tough watching all of that. And then so I, I learned a certain model. Uh, a certain, uh, I certainly learned a lot of hard work from her. But when I went to buy a house, I was following like my sort of culture. Like you, you get married, you buy a home, you do this. But like it was the wrong thing to do. Like mm. I saved up all this money. I worked really hard. I was supporting my mom. I was contributing towards the bills while I was living at home. Um, change all the direct debits into my account. like, And I, I did that. And I, I didn't have any help is, is what I'm getting at. Um, what The help I got was the lessons my mom gave us and like just watch it, leading by example. That was the help I got. And I'll take that help over any kind of financial help any day because you know it's, it's worked out well. But I went online and I searched and like Aussie home loans was a big thing. And, you know, when Aussie home loans, a local broker came to my house and, you know, that was like, I was 22, 22 years old. And I I bought it, I bought, um, I got a pre-approval and then ended up buying a house. Um, the house sat there for, I think three or four months before we got married. And then, so it was empty and we moved in after that we got married. But, um, yeah, that was just a mortgage broker and all respect to them. Like it was probably just like, oh yeah, first time we, when I bought a house, there was no home buyer grants. There was no, no help. I remember getting, having to make a bank check for 33 grand or something mm. to, for stamp duty. And I remember going <laughs> so like reluctant to hand that over. I'm like, as if I'm paying 33 grand, it took me to ages government. to save this yeah. to the government. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, just, you know, a number of years before that, my brother bought a property and he bought in an area that is now like maybe three to like 300% capital, gro- capital growth. Um, and he paid, I think, half a million bucks in a much nicer area and got a first home buyer's grant and stuff like that. So the market changed so much between in that few years where basically I bought... Um, a property for around 800 grand and it was like at, almost at the peak of that period and so like i didn't see or not see much capital growth at all but it's owner occupier and that was just how i thought you do things you just like buy a house probably what would have been smarter is to buy an investment in a high capital growth area you know in lived even in in, in our parents house or in my mum's house or in her, her mum's house for a year two years the capital growth would have let us buy a second a third a fourth property and then we could have had an own occupier plus all these investments. So the advice model, if someone had told me, if I had someone like you, Victor, and you told me, look, I know you want to do that because you want your own place to live, but why not just rent mm. or live with your parents for the first year, buy a good investment in one of these areas, you're going to get this capital growth, you're going to be able to refinance and take equity out and buy the next one, the next one, the next one. Yep. Um, yeah, again, it's just like, this is why brokers are important. Not because like you can take an application and submit it to a lender. That's, I agree with you. Those days are numbered, mate. Yeah. Edge cases, complex scenarios, advice, mm. strategy. That is where you will earn your money as a broker because you're adding so much value. We're not talking about difference between 0.1, 0.2% between banks. We're talking about the difference between being able to buy three investment properties or being able to buy virtually as many as you want you know, because you're getting the right rental yield, you're getting the right return, you're getting right. enough capital growth to su- support deposits on future properties. Yep. Um, and then we're talking about millions of dollars, not 0.1 of a percent on 600 grand, 800 grand, uh, that kind of thing. But man, I, I bought my property and it was with uh, it was with Bank West at the time. 
I think it was like 98% LVR. Like it was 5% deposit plus um, stamp duty. Plus LMI cap. Yep. Uh, plus LMI cap. Yeah, yep. that's it. Okay. So um, now it was leveraged. There was no equity in that property. There's probably still no equity in that property. You know what I mean? <laughs> like leveraged. But yep. I was like, I just knew property. Pro yep. Like, you know, you've got to buy a house that's and right. this is what you got to do. But a few small tweaks to my enthusiasm and ambitiousness would have yielded me like a lot better results in, you know, that was 22, um, nearly 10 years ago, literally nearly 10 years ago. I turned 32 this year. So, um, but yeah, crazy. It's like, that is the difference between a mortgage broker and a mortgage advisor. And I use the term mortgage broker and I refer to all of them because I don't want to devalue that term because a lot of people still use that term. And when you refer to mortgage brokers, still referring to really high caliber mortgage brokers. And I know many of them work in getting the pleasure to work with so many of them, but mm. um, it's really about advice and strategy now. Like that's where the top tier mortgage brokers are going. Yeah. hundred percent. So this is actually um, why uh, my business partner and I, uh, we set up a new business called Propeller, P-R-O-P-E-L-A. And it is, unbiased property strategy and it's being we're actually uh, partnering uh, collaborating uh, with a data analytics company called hashtag higher than average growth and we're building an online community and that's why i'm in sydney so we we're recording um, some videos yesterday and we're going to be basically creating a wait list of investors as well as other uh, finance professionals accountants uh, financial planners mortgage brokers and even buyers agents because what we're doing is we're creating a online community uh, to educate investors based on what investors are actually struggling with so rather than just going out there and saying this is what you should know about lmi about uh, buying at a trust or you know going to this lender first and, and planning this well let's hear it straight from the horse's mouth like what do they actually want to know what are the challenges in this space because there's so much noise out there yeah, yeah, yeah. and unfortunately most of that noise is coming from people and organizations that are incentivized to sell property they get yeah. paid and they get paid a lot of money right sometimes unfortunately it's it's at the cost of the investor yeah. you know and and sometimes On, it's not disclosed and you know what's crazy is like a lot of those property companies actually approach us because they know we work with a lot of mortgage brokers and they're like hey, we'll pay you X amount to put us in front of your mortgage brokers. I'm like, man, I don't want anything to do with that. So exactly. it's just, yeah, I would never jeopardize my reputation by, you know, sort of putting other businesses like that in front of mortgage brokers and, you know, then them getting involved in sort of jamming unfit for purpose properties down people's throats. You know, Correct. it's like, even like I'm, I'm not a mortgage broker. I'm, like I know 1% of what you know about the mortgage side. The asset finance, that's my jam. You know, I know that space very well. But like even I know some of the off-the-plan properties are, um, you know, not really good long-term investments. You know, you're better off buying something freehold and, you know, um, you know, existing really. Um, you know, I know some people have gotten lucky and, you know, between the time they placed the order and the time, you know, right. right, they got... they. Um, that can happen as well. You know, it's not always bad, but the chance that you get that right is a lot smaller than if you, you know, Correct. pick a, pick a, an up and coming area. Um, lots of, you know, you do a lot of people do research about like what's coming, what what, what what's happening in the town planning side of things, like right. new shopping center coming up here, new infrastructure, train stations, this that. Like, if you do your research properly, or you talk to a professional who definitely does their research, you're gonna start to get way better results than just you know you know, talking to properties, you know, s selling something that looks brand new and shiny. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and, and there are some benefits to buy new, right? Like because, you know, depreciation, you get more benefits up front. Um, you're, it's easier to, usually easier to rent out because you don't have to pay any money to do any improvements and people like to rent a new property. Um, but if it's in an area that's got a lot of supply or it's going to have a lot of supply, that's more competition that's going to slow down the growth, right? Because ultimately it comes down to supply and demand. So if it's if there's a lot of demand, not enough supply, it's going to push prices upwards, right? So uh, if you're able to buy in tight pockets and able to identify um, affordable areas based on your borrowing capacity, based on your uh, you know affordability, if rates go up higher, then you can actually you know, time the market quite well. And on top of that, if you add in 
uh, a strategy that um, is not based on market growth, but based on um, just valuations. So for example, if you buy a property that has uh, three bedrooms, but it's got a second living room that can be converted into a fourth. Mm. So you can know with today's market, what's a three better worth, what's a four better worth. And if you, if you account for those costs, you can essentially manufacture equity straight away. Yeah, yeah. So you're not relying on market growth. The data might tell you you're going to get market growth, but it's not, it's not, um, nece- it's not necessary, right? And then same thing goes with a, with a retain and subdivide, right? So if you can, you know, town planning and whatnot, you can identify if there's, uh, you know, the ability to subdivide that lot. doesn't mean you have to develop on it, but if you own that and you retain it over time, you'll have the choice to pay for that subdivision um, split the title, sell it, uh, or if you had the ability to borrow, then you can build as well. And they yeah. have two dwellings, right? Um, and then the other one is just, you know, a, a granny flat play. So if you know which councils will allow that um, without going through, you know, full planning permits and you can go straight to approval and you account for that cost, you're increasing your rental yield. Um, so your cash flow improves. So it's very strategy and client specific. And I think people's sort of skip that and they go straight into speculation <laughs> so it doesn't matter what shiny <laughs> stuff you present if you just jump straight in without considering that it's speculation but the roof has an infinity pool you know <laughs> what i mean yeah That's it's right. like I, I get it i mean yeah. we are emotional creatures you know and the thought of like this lifestyle and the, the beautiful brochures that they show you and the model the 3d models right. it, like i've seen it you know like this is yeah. Um, I get calls all the time from people. I don't even know how I'm on these lists. I swear to God, I've never put one inquiry through, but I get calls. They're like, you know, this new development, blah, blah, blah. Um, anyway, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's such an interesting one. But this technology play seems like a really good one. Um, I know there's sort of, um, there's a real need for that. You know, there's a real, e- real need for people to get access to information at their fingertips and good information yeah. and insights yeah. and data and um but you've always been like someone who's tinkering and trying new technologies so like you know what are the main things that you use in your business that you've found help yeah so i mean probably the thing that everyone uses a lot of people use is um, calendar booking systems right yeah. calendly it's a big one acuity there's a few others i've been using calendly over the years but I've now um, moved my CRM or my marketing CRM into a into a software called um, High Level or Go High Level, which is uh, it's like a HubSpot competitor. Um, it is it is cheaper, but it's very uh, you got to know what you're doing to make changes. That's the only downfall. So you do need an agency to help you, and so it has cost a bit to to customize. But what I like about it is that um, you know customer. Uh, messages, um, calendar bookings, um, like so Zoom calls, phone calls, it's all integrated within the platform. Um, and even like uh, Twilio VoIP phone calls are all done within the platform. So you can track phone calls, record them, <laughs> track messages, track emails. It's a two-way sync uh, with Gmail or Office 365. So you can keep a record of all that in one place. And you can also build marketing uh, funnels. So you can do landing pages, uh, even full-fledged websites. Um, and so that's the thing that I guess at its core is what I'm working on at the moment to, to manage um, not just Lugs Financial, but also the Propeller customer journey. And then uh, in terms of the mortgage origination software, um, I'm a sales tracker user. Brokers use all different softwares. Um, I'm not on sales tracker 2.0 yet. I'm still using the old one. I don't know how long it'll be. Um, but I also don't think it should all be in under one platform because if, if, if your mortgage origination software is your CRM and it does everything, um, it means that you don't really own that customer data, right? Like they kind of do, right? They have owned it, especially if it's through the aggregator, but, but also if you're able to customize it more, if it's aggregator, mm-hmm a position and you can't really change things as much as you would like. You need them to agree. But once you um, are able to put it into a high level, then you can actually, you know, create different journeys for clients and automate certain um, communications. And, and that's what I'm trying to be able to offer also into the, to the other, to the marketplace. And there's another tool I started using is called uh, hound hound. Oh yeah. 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 You heard about that? Familiar, yeah. 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 I was speaking to the guys yesterday. Yeah, and um, I'm looking at integrating that with high level. It's probably a bit of a process to do that, but basically, it's it's to be able to offer that um, 
better value proposition to clients because you talked about earlier about how our asset finance brokers will do one deal, yeah. settle and never hear from you again, right? Whereas mortgage brokers, a lot of them also do that and they'll only contact them when they've passed the clawback period so they can refinance them and they don't want to do double the work for the same amount of money. So what, what I think Hound can help solve is that it, it keeps track of all the interest rates, the balances, the LVRs, and it sort of prompts you as a broker to be able to say, get in touch with my client. Their rate's no longer competitive. So you can go and reprice them, get, her, yeah. get them a better rate. Or if you if they are investor clients, you can identify if there's equity. more equity. Yeah, right. Yeah. And now you can you can sort of preempt the, the client and say, yep, you know, you told me that you want to grow your wealth. Well, guess what? Your value of your property may have gone up 150 grand. So do you want to do something? So I want to be able to automate that communication to the clients so that you, you're you not doing all this unnecessary work. You might end up ordering valuations, getting rates and doing all this. You call them up and they say, oh, I just lost my job. <laughs> like, damn, I just did all this work for nothing. Um, so it's always good to be able to, you know, send them a text. And then if they say yes, they reply. And based on their reply, then your staff get to work. Yeah. Right? Um, and, you know, like loan options. I love that the tech is on my website. Yeah. Because it allows the clients to be able to, you know, fill out the forms and a lot of that's pre-filled. And this yeah. is why we're obviously, we're also meeting today is because um, that's lacking in the mortgage broking yeah. industry. Most of it is a long fact find and, and it's, it's actually quite tedious for clients to do that. Yeah, we've definitely noticed that. And our approach, because, you know, everybody asks us, when's the home loan variation coming? And, you know, to be honest with you, um, when we first started out, we were very hesitant to even put a home loan inquiry form because we thought mortgage brokers are going to confuse us as a competitor. You know, they're going to see loan options. They're going to see a home loan logo on our thing. And then oh, we can't deal with them. They're going to steal our clients, you know? And that's kind of, it was just my perception of like what, how we're going to be received in the market. Um, and we, so we demoed it first without the home loan widget and people said, this is great, but like, why can't it just capture home loan inquiries for me as well? Otherwise, I'm not going to put it in the hero section of my website like because we're not an asset broker we're a home loan broker we need to prioritize that and so between the first time we exhibited there wasn't one more the next week we executed on that in one week and and our team um delivered that and we had a home loan inquiry and we showed people that this is what is um uh this is what you can have on your site and then people loved it and we started to get traction and they were like now your asset finance journey especially when we launched 3.0 because 2.0 was good but I mean, it was just not in the same ballpark as 3.0. It's just a different level now with all the OCR and the pre-filling and all that kind of stuff and all the integrations. Um, everyone's question now is, when are you going to make that fact find or that application form for home loans? And again, I was like, in my mind, I'm thinking if we do that, they're going to think, oh, it's only a matter of time before they start doing mortgages. But I think we've built enough trust now and that's both through per personal branding, our presence at all these events and the support that we provide to mortgage brokers, our reputation, all that kind of stuff. People are like, no, they, they genuinely don't want to do mortgages. Like we are a specialist. You know, I'm a big believer in laser focus, like no plan B, burn the boats. Like everybody knows I always say that, burn the boats, you know. Um, so we're asset finance. That's what we're going to do. We'll probably add synergistic products to that, like maybe car insurance or something like that. Um, but everything that we build in terms of technology for home loans, like the fact find and things like that, that'll be a SaaS only. Like that's, we're not ever going to do home loans. That's, I've made that very, very clear. Um, and so everyone will still get, a, will still get access to have the existing inquiry form and stuff for free. And probably a couple of the partners who've supported us and backed us all the way in, uh, like yourself, um, will allow to pilot this new uh, one and, and probably the early stage adopters of that may not have to pay for it. Um, but everyone else will be a SaaS. You want the home loan application technology? Because like right now, who is there in the market? Um, there's Lendy up here and then there's really like Daylight all the way down. Actually, Finspo is pretty good. Um, you know home loans, TikTok home loans. Um, there's a few, but I think like from the broker side, Lendy's like the benchmark, I would say, like in terms of the tech. Uh, I know you could probably tell me otherwise, but um, imagine being able to give really like tier one technology to every broker. So then again, it's like leveling the playing field. So 
now you can compete with the, the bigger big boys. boys. <clears throat> um, and, you know, people will hopefully be, you know, prepared to pay for that because we have no other way to monetize the home loan tech. Like, we, we don't do home loans. So we can't, like, it's not like we can stand up homeloanoptions.ai. By the way, we do own that domain, but we own it so that nobody else can start it and, like, mimic us, you know. But um, uh, we've trademarked it all anyway, but, you know, we, we bought, like, a bunch of verticals. But, you know, we, we, we can't do home loans. Um, we have so many mortgage partners now that it, we would self-destruct if we started. Um, and we don't want to, regardless, even if we could. And even if everyone trusted us enough... Um, that there wouldn't be a conflict of interest. Uh, we still wouldn't. But um, the only way we can monetize that and continue to reinvest in that is by two things. One is the home loan brokers continue to support us by sending us asset finance. And so we're going to create a model that's like the brokers who do support us, basically, um, every time they send us an asset finance deal, it'll get rebated off whatever cost they have to pay for the software. So it's going to create hopefully two things. One is a sustainable recurring revenue for the home loan tech that we can continue to reinvest to make it better. And then two, hopefully drive more asset finance referrals because they'll be like, here's how much it costs. Or it's free if you give us, you know, two deals a month or something, you know. Um, Smart. So, you know, we, we're still working through that. And, you know, we're going to have a workshop very soon about this. And when we're ready to do the, the grand launch, we'll have an event and invite a bunch of people to it. We're very excited by it because um, we think that this is a big gap. And, you know, there's other good, there's other companies that are doing great stuff like Maestro is doing some good stuff. And, um, you know, uh, th there's, there's other solutions, but not, none as slick as ours. And I'm saying that 100% biased. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no one's doing, you know, OCR of the license, pre-fill your data, making it super easy. In the asset finance space, we pre-fill roughly 80% of the data now for clients. Wow. They just, three steps, you know, obviously provide your consent that, you know, let's not count that as a step. They tick a box and, you know, agree to the privacy in terms of conditions. But step one, upload your license. Step two, connect your bank statements. That pre-fills all of your income and expenses. And obviously the license pre-fills all of the data, like your license number, date of birth, all the boring stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. But that takes time. You know, think about you got to get your license out of your pocket and then like look at it and then type it. And now lenders want you to put the card number in as well as the license number for ID, uh, for yeah. fraud reduction and so the purposes. Back and stuff, yeah. And so, yeah. And um, so you could put that stuff in. And so now an application is five minutes or less instead of 15, 20 minutes. And the third thing we do is a soft check on the credit file. And we pull all of the comprehensive credit reporting data in, including their liabilities. So if they've got multiple mortgages and stuff like that, and because they should be on the credit file now, it pre-fills them. So like the income and expenses and even some of the assets, like if they have their super connected to their bank, we can get the superannuation data. If they have savings in their account, then we can pull that into the savings. for. The How does it do the expenses? Cause well, it's obviously they'd use Ilion and yeah. we, we categorize it um, in just some ma main buckets. But we also provide the bank statements, Ilion file, the summary. Yeah. So if people want different, to break it down differently or different lenders interpret things. For the home loan tech, we want to use Lixi, the Lixi standard, because I think that's like pretty much what all the lenders use. Um, but yeah, it's like, you know, income uh, should be on the bank statements, the frequency, the amount. If there's commissions or bonuses, they'll come in as like irregular payments. If they have rental income, it'll, it can pull that in as other income. What about fraud detection? Well, bank statements um, That's a lot of that. Uh, help solve that. That's one tool, the ID. Mm. And we also implemented this new fraud detection um, tool. And it, it's quite intelligent and it's quite unintrusive, which is good. So it just goes in the background. And when they put their email address in, what it's actually doing is scraping the data from the web to see which accounts they have under that email address. And so it's pretty cool. And it gives us a fraud score. And we can also interpret it and do our own decisioning on it. But if someone's doing an ID takeover, right, they usually have just come recently into this possession of this ID. They create a burner email address. They get a burner mobile number. And so we can do the mobile number as well with a similar thing, see when it was created, which telco provider. We can see if it's a soft phone. So, um, and 
yeah and so you know they're doing the fraud detection on the email it's going to see do they have a netflix account a disney <laughs> account you know like all this stuff you Smart, know yeah and so if it's just like a, an email that was created two weeks ago and they've only got a gmail and it's a gmail address you're like ah oh, something sus here mm. and it just makes us ask more questions so we might do biometrics up front you know we might um do a liveness check with a facetime call or um we might if they're sydney based we might insist on meeting them you know um come to our office we'll you know make your coffee we need to meet and just pretend it's part of the process not to raise alarm bells or we'll come to you you know um we'll do further employment checks we'll check the pay slips we'll make sure we've got the bank statement so it just it's a level of escalation in the um does it do automatic process. abn checks from the employer yeah either? and yeah, and uh uh, we're Jeez. working on OCR pay slips as well. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. That's that's, what the, that's the fraud detection piece when they've actually made up year to dates and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. so we're going to actually do the, all the calculations to make sure all the math lines up because, yeah. look, uh, it'll match the bank statements as a net. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, that's so so, good. so, so exciting, man. Look, you know, we we do have a limited amount of resources, and we're always like trying to prioritize what's most important and what's next. And so it's like, you know. Um, it's one of the downsides of being bootstrapped. You know, you don't have an unlimited amount of money to go and hire as many developers as you need because like, man, I have so many great ideas and, <laughs> you know, we are good at executing, but we just execute slower than maybe someone who has a bunch of VC capital, um, you know, to do it. So, um, but yeah, look, we're, we're so excited by the sort of the next phase and we've been promising people that it's coming before the end of the year. We're going to launch in phases. Phase one will be without lender matching. Um, and so it'll be the fact fine and stuff, but one of the big hurdles to overcome there is like, there's obviously a lot of lenders, but then aggregator each panel ag ones. It, yeah. yeah sure. Which aggregators have which lenders and then down one layer further than that, that we need to account for is like, which brokers have which accreditations? Cause your aggregator might have 40, 50 lenders, maybe more, but you might only be accredited with 20 of them, you know? And so like, we need to be able to, let's say there's a master list. Um, and then by aggregator, turn on and off which ones. And then by broker, turn on and off which ones that are the subset of, you know, the aggregator. The aggregator is a subset list and then the broker is a subset list. And then brokers that might have their own ACL have their own aggregator panel plus others, you know. So it's like there's problems to solve. And then obviously all the lending credit policy. What we would prefer to do is partner um, and... Um, we'll maybe talk about some of that off camera, yep. but, um, you know, there, there's some opportunities there that I think would be really, really cool, really exciting and really make a splash in the market. And, um, yeah, just take the whole industry to a new level and people can subscribe and pay for it. It'll level the playing field so that now brokers that have great servers, have a great offering, add true value to their clients can compete with the likes of, you know, the lendies or, you know, you know, home loans or, you know, whoever, TikTok. Um. And one second, add um, um, strategy as a service because what Propeller is. Yeah. <laughs> That's going to also allow them to help their clients achieve financial freedom. And then other brokers can use Correct. the service as well because you're like, you know, that's a strength of yours and you're mm -hmm. putting all this, your, your IP into this project. And brokers who need to adapt to survive that maybe are just like doing the, you know, collect and submit. <laughs> that's right. Um, you know, they're going to be able to offer this. So, mate, this has been a great, great chat. And um, what we do before we wrap up is um, always get our guests to do a 60 second pitch. You can pick whether you want to do it on Propeller or, or, or Lagos, um, but I'll leave that to you. When I, on the count of three, I just want you to give us like, you know, why Lagos or why Propeller? You know, why should that somebody listening to this go, um, I, want to, I want to deal with Victor and his team. Okay. Three, two, one, go for it. So property investors, they want to understand how do they build wealth through property. They ask their accountant. Accountant says, I can't. I do tax returns, uh, help you with trust, etc." So they ask their financial planner. Financial planner can't because they focus on personal insurances, you know, stocks, bonds, uh, et cetera. They ask their mortgage broker. Mortgage broker says, I do loans and help you loan match based on, <laughs> on home loans, construction loans, etc." So they're not giving you strategy. So who's left? Buyers agents that charge 15, 20 grand up front or a percentage, uh, and property marketeers who can sometimes make 50,000 commission that you pay for as an investor. Propeller is born because myself and my business partner, 
uh, Jack Foraker have specialized in property investment in finance. Property fundamentally is a game of finance. So this is which lender to go with who, structuring, um, you know, non-bank, SMSF, and even commercial. So by understanding that, we're now bringing in the best minds and we're also bringing property data. We're combining that into an education portal to provide content to investors to what they actually need to help them execute strategically and have the right information to make better informed decisions. And ultimately, we're going to be providing uh, tailored property plans considering all these aspects and we're going to connect their advisor, we're going to connect their accountant, we're going to connect their mortgage broker and we're going to help them manage that. It doesn't mean it's all under one umbrella. They actually get to plug them all in and we will help execute that and project manage that with them. Amazing. Well, mate, I'm very excited um, to see this unfold. Um, I know you're a real stickler for detail and um, I know that you're going to execute this like phenomenally. So, mate, um, it's a pleasure uh, being associated with you. I love everything you do. And, um, mate, always, anytime you're in Sydney, you know we, we've got a second home for you. So, well, Honestly, I've been waiting for this time to come and it's yeah. actually the perfect timing yeah. because, yeah, this is about to launch and, you know, hopefully we can uh, talk about some partnership opportunities. Fantastic, mate. Sounds Thanks, great. Thank you. Thanks, Victor. Take care, mate.